Martin Amos has been called many things, among them misogynist, Islamophobe, a snob. He calls himself a comic novelist. He's the author of 14 novels, two collections of stories, six nonfiction books, and a memoir. And now he's got a new collection called The Rub of Time, Bello, Nabokov, Hitchens, Travolta, Trump, Essays, and Reportage, 1994 to 2017. And it is a pleasure to welcome him to our studio tonight. Welcome. Thank you. Do you think that you're misunderstood? I just named off a few things that people have called you, but do you think you're misunderstood? Um, yeah, I think it's settling down. The, I mean, the, the rubbish about misogyny. Uh, it's a very cheap shot, that. I mean, what can you, what can you say? Uh, um, but I, I regard myself not only as a feminist, but as a gynocrat. I, I look forward to a, a utopia where women are in charge. How do you think that would change things? Well, I mean, uh, I don't think it would be very difficult to do better than men. Um, I mean, look at human history. It's a mess. Um, <clears throat> that old historian's convention of referring to women, uh, to countries as female, you know, France thought it was in her best interest, to, et cetera. Uh, that was never more than a sort of false gallantry. Uh, countries behave like men and could, could do uh, very urgently with the injection of some female qualities. What happens is that when a woman is running for power, um, she thinks she has to be more as masculine as a man. And I, I want them to concentrate on their female qualities. And I think Angela Merkel does, is Just the that. nearest we've come to that. Mm -hmm. She doesn't, she's not like Margaret Thatcher. Everyone thought Margaret Thatcher was a, a man. She, who kept going into the wrong toilet. Um, she and Hillary Clinton uh, was saying how she was going to wipe Iran off the map if they did this. Um, that kind of aggressive talk is, we've tried that, you know. For, but do you think maybe it's just responding to what people expect women to be, if you're empowered, to be taken seriously? Um, that's what, that's the thinking. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, you know, there, there have been about 50 women head of states, and maybe a third of those got to be head of states through marriage or through heredity. Um, I want a woman to be elected on, on the merits, uh, and, the, and these should be feminine merits. And we all know the, the major difference between men and women, which is violence. Uh, reliance on force, and uh, that has um, not produced a shining record in history. So, the do new you, approach. Do you think, like the charge of misogynist, is from the, some of the work that you've written in the past? Um, I'm, I do blush a bit when I look at my very early novels, um, but the one that is often taken as an example of misogyny is, in fact programmatically feminist novel. That's the novel called Money, my fifth novel. And, and since then, I think I've been, um, and it's not, I was, I spent a day with Gloria Steinem in the early 80s. And I read her piece, What If Men Menstruated? And it completely converted me. And uh, she says, among other things, that if men menstruated, they would boast about how much and how often. And, and how painful maybe it is. <laughs> yeah, and, um, and, and she said, street guys would high five and say, hey man, you're looking good. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm on the rag. It would, it would be um, a, a macho thing. And she said, and if that were the case, uh, abortion would be a sacrament, she said. Um, it would flip everything. Over the course of your career, you've been asked to name um, what your favorite book is. And you've said that you can't do that because it's like naming your favorite child. But having to go through your essays and your, your repertoire to uh, have this collection, how did you choose what essays to include? I basically put them all in. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did, I pruned it a bit. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's not much fun writing an essay. Reportage is easy mm -hmm. because you're given a narrative. But um, 
a literary essay, a long literary essay, is the hardest thing I do. But you do it over and over again. Why? Uh, I always think, oh, you've done it again. You've agreed to do it again. Um, I do it because work ethic. Uh, there was Protestant work, work ethic. Mm. There was absolutely not a whisper of pro Protestantism in my childhood house. Um, in fact, when I had to fill in a form at school, uh, at home for school, and it said age, etc., and it said religion, and I went out into the passage and shouted up the stairs, Mom, what religion are we? And there was a really long silence. And then she said, in a best, she said, Church of England. <laughs> uh, which, of course, is, is hardly a religion at all. Mm -hmm. um, the question of God never came up. But the work ethic was just in the air. And you're quite funny. Um, you're, do you, do you, are you able to sneak that more in the essays as opposed to the repertoires? Um, I th well, the, you know, if you think about it, um, as Saul Bellow in the, one of the last things he wrote, saying it, it's the case that almost all of the novels, the great novels, uh, the good novels, are written by uh, humorists. Nabokov said that uh, anyone who's any good is going to be funny. Uh, and there must be a reason for that. And the reason is that, that life itself is funny. I mean, not, not the big events, not the wars and the volcanoes and earthquakes, but our daily dealings are, are somehow comic. They, say, they, they sometimes say of politicians, well, of course, he's a bit humorless. But that's a really grave accusation. It means you have no common sense either. But you've posed that accusation to Jeremy Corbyn and I think Donald Trump. Yeah. Clive James said a brilliant thing about uh, uh, humor. He said, humor is just common sense moving at a different speed. Mm -hmm. um, it's just common sense dancing. That's all humor is. And what is the title of the book alluding to, The Rub of Time? <clears throat> well, it has two applications, two main applications. One is that time is the only, the value judgment in literature, in lit crit, is, is the sort of holy grail that people have been, you know, how do you prove that one piece of writing is better than an obviously less good piece of writing? And the answer is you can't prove it. Um, it's a fool's errand, that. Um, all you can do is labor the point and impose your own taste. But there is a judge time is the, is the only force that, uh, that delivers real value judgments. If, if a novel has survived for a century and is still read, mm -hmm. that's a very strong indication of its quality. Um, and Jane Austen is a, an excellent example of a, a writer who renews herself for every generation. Do you think about that, about whether your work will stand the test of time? Um, yeah, in a sort of sneaky way. It's, it's, it's ironic because, um, and humorous again, in that when you die, uh, when a novelist dies, you'd think there'd be an upsurge of interest in that writer. But in fact, they, they go dormant for about five years. It's not like pop stars, huh? Uh, yeah, and um, my Spanish publisher said, you, when you die, you have to go to purgatory and burn off your sins. And then, with luck, and it, it, you can time it, uh, the interest reappears. Uh, and the result being that you never do find out if you're any good when you're alive. Only your ghost is ever going to know whether you're any good. And that keeps you honest in some way. The other less funny uh, uh, reason for calling it the rub of time is, is what time does to the writer. Um, and it's usually pretty disastrous. What does it do? Um, it dilutes you. It, you can go wrong in all sorts of ways. The great stylist John Updike lost his ear. Um, his, his last book of stories, the prose, is is deaf to the rhythm of a sentence. Um, ear doesn't just mean catching dialogue. It means you know, a sentence that rolls mellifluously along. Um, 
Do you think that has something to do with, say, when you write your first book, maybe you're writing it for yourself, but then after the book comes, you know, people write their reviews on it, and then maybe you start to write according to what people think is oh, good? No. Or? No. 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 Uh, <clears throat> no, you, you write for yourself. But you, do you think that's what happens when people become, uh, as you said, deaf to the ear? Well, it, it doesn't happen until you're about 70. <laughs> so you have, you have until then, and then it, then it begins to erode. And Wait, it, aren't you almost 70, or? Sorry? Aren't you almost 70? Yeah, 70 <laughs> next year. Uh, but um, and, and that, it didn't, it, it's, a, it's a very recent phenomenon, this, because um, Shakespeare died at 57, Dickens at 56, Jane Austen 42, uh, Byron 35, Keats 25, Shelley 29. Um, it didn't come up, you know. Shakespeare never had to worry about his powers failing because uh, he... he was at his prime, maybe. He was in his prime when he died, as they all were. Um, so the the doddery novelist is a is a 20th century phenomenon, um, and women, funnily enough, or not, or as they proved in other spheres, uh, are more resilient than men. And uh, Penelope Fitz, Fitzgerald wrote her best stuff in her 80s. My own stepmother, Elizabeth Jane Howard, wrote her masterpiece, five volume masterpiece, in her 70s and 80s. Um, it, there are exceptions, but uh, most writers just do become watery. Their talent, talent and originality are the same thing, really. Mm -hmm. um, and your originality gets worn down. Your energy gets worn down. It's, it's perfectly natural and... Um, so as you approach your 70th birthday, is aging on your mind? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, it's on my mind anyway. Um, but I don't, I, I feel that I can't work for as long every day now. It used to be four or five hours, now it's three, maybe four hours. Um, and you stop not because you're tired, but because what you're writing is no good anymore. It's, um, you're done for the day. What was it like for your dad when he got older, Kingsley Amos? Well, he, he wrote his best novel when he was um, in his mid-60s. And, and then the novels after that, some five or six novels, and uh, two or three of them very, very good, not up to his very best. And then this book he'd been writing cumulatively over the years came out after he died and it's one of his best books. Uh, so maybe you're wrong in your theory? Yeah, but he died at 74. <laughs> I mean, it, it's not much of a window. Um, although heredity, heredity doesn't play a huge part in how long you, you're gonna live. Mm. I think Philip Roth did the dignified thing and just stopped, um, retired. Mm. And there he is in Manhattan. What does he do all day? Um, apparently he reads reads history mostly. Um, but do you think that it's a conscious choice or you just... It was in his case. Mm -hmm. um, and I know another writer who stopped writing and, and learned French. Um, but you don't want to do that? Not yet. Um, I, I really worry about how I would fill the day and I would, I, I would miss that feeling when I get up in the morning is that I want to get into my study and, and have this adventure because unlike the essay, fiction is, is, has a large element of play in it. And, um, I, and the imagination is a, a mysterious force and feeling your way into other lives is very exciting. And you've said that it's an unconscious thing. You just... It just takes the, you over. The subconscious does an awful lot of the work. Um, it, it, very mysterious. And if you come up against a problem in what you're writing, I, as a young man, I would bang my head against it and try and force my way through. Now I just walk away. And uh, when it's fixed, 
and you don't know it's fixed because you haven't given it any thought, you find yourself back at your desk and it is fixed. It's an amazing process. You're working on something right now, right? Oh, yeah. I'm coming to the end of a long novel. Uh, I'm not, haven't been very happy with it, but I feel I've got to get it done. Do you think that you're your own worst critic? Yeah, I think automatically you are that. Um, harshest crit critic. Um, <clears throat> it's a novel in the genre called life writing, where it's about you know your real life, and uh, I'm, which is a huge genre. Um, everything from your gardening column to these enormous novels by that. Norwegian guy, the, my struggle, you know, the 12 volumes or whatever it is. Um, and it, it's a very unsatisfactory genre. It began with D.H. Lawrence. Um, no one had dreamt of just writing about what happened to them. Dickens never did that, you know. Um, it was, that was considered, you know, off, off limits. Kind of cheating in a way, maybe? And Maybe cheating in a way? Yeah, well, yes, what I find I mean, Lawrence got into the trouble with the law a lot um, for obscenity, but also for libel, because he was writing about society hostesses who sued him, um, recognizable social figures who you know, took him to court. Um, and there's all that sort of sensitivity about what you, what you feel able to say about living people. And in this novel I'm writing, they're named, and they're well known, and they're writers. Um, there's that, but there's also, it seems to me, very inartistic form. And I think the only writer who's ever got very far with this autobiographical fiction, and there's a lot of it, a lot of it there now, is uh, Saul Bellow, who, and it's just, through sheer visionary penetration of reality that he creates something artistic. But, but it's beyond most people, and I think it might be beyond me. But I'm, I feel I've got to get it done. Then I can write something that I've been much more urgently wanting to write, which is about race in America. Why is that something that's on your mind? Um, well, I was aware of America's history before I came to live in America. And I lived in America as a child. And um, I was, I was in, enamored of a black boy in my school. Marty? Marty, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I said, I used the usual come on line of English school children, which is, would you like to come to my house for tea one day? Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, I prefer coffee. And I said, <laughs> you can have coffee, you can have whatever you like. And they said, no, nah, your mom wouldn't like me. And I said, why? And she said, he said, because I'm black. And I said, I, I don't remember saying this, but it's in my mother's diary. I said, I told my mother I said it. She said, my mother won't even notice you're black. And it, that, our family was like that. I mean, instinctively progressive. So I, I mean, I, and then I went to his house, and that was a very strange experience for me. Because you you stood out, you felt you felt your. I, fe I felt so. Ex um, they couldn't have been nicer, mm -hmm. but I felt so self-conscious. You know that self-consciousness of teenage years where you feel you're going to faint. Yeah, been there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and um, so that that embedded this interest in me um, about race in America, which is th there were no coloured people. Uh, everyone was white in England. Um, so it was, they were exotic and attractive to me. And then now that I've realized what I really can't bear about Trump is, is the completely cynical um, reopening of that wound. Um, he was told at some point, he was very popular with minorities because of The Apprentice, that he was told by some quack like Steve Bannon. He said, the only way you're going to make any impression politically is by uh, appealing to, to white racists. So you don't think that he's actually racist, but 
just... He just no, complete opportunism. Um, I think he, he, he does show... Um, he certainly behaved like a racist um, ever since he began his Bertha campaign against Obama mm -hmm. and things like the Central Park muggers that he wanted to ex have executed. Uh, I, I want to continue on Trump, but uh, I'm going to ask you more on Trump later, and okay. that's going to be on tomorrow's show. Um, but when you, I wanted to go back to the collection of essays. Um, when you were younger, uh, you would criticize older writers. But you actually said to Christopher Hitchens, the late Christopher Hitchens, that don't cheek your elders. Why not? I mean, you cheek your elders with gusto when you're in your 20s. Of course you do. That, that is uh, youthful, uh, you know, iconoclasm. But also, it's a slight corruption of power, I think, that you, you, you can influence the fate of a book and you think, I'll write a career-ending review of this book. Um, but it's a, it's a youthful sin. That, and, um, and you certainly, what I was accusing Christopher Hitchens of was um, the greater sin of ingratitude. Because he was criticizing Philip Ross, Saul Bellow, and John Updike, who I know had given him great pleasure um, and he was jeering at them for what we've been talking about, loss of power. Um, and I, th I think there's something unattractive about that. It, it, looks, it looks awful. Mm. Did um, he take your advice, though? No. <laughs> no, no. No one takes any advice <laughs> about anything. <laughs> well, you write um, uh, in the collection of essays, about Christopher Hitchens, that Christopher is bored by the epithet contrarian, which has been trailing him around for a quarter of a century. What he is, in any case, is an auto-contrarian. He seeks not just the most difficult position, but the most difficult position for Christopher Hitchens. Uh, what did you mean by that? Well, I, I'm just this, as we speak, I'm writing about Christopher in this novel. And, um, you know, he submitted himself for uh, waterboarding treatment. Um, in 2008, he went to some little shack in North Carolina, and representatives of the special forces waterboarded him. You can watch it on YouTube. Why um, would he do that? Good question. <laughs> um, it, well, he, he said pro bono, you know, to, is it torture or isn't it? I wanted to answer that question. But, um, you know, he he has had a lifelong phobia about drowning. He had, even before he got sick you know, with cancer, he, he would wake up feeling smothered. He had apnea, which is where you cease breathing in the middle of the night. Um, and, and I suddenly remembered, you know, in the year 2000, walking with him at a, 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 a very gentle incline in California and he was struggling for breath. I mean, he obviously had emphysema a bit. And when he submitted himself for torture, um, he, he said he, he had to produce a certificate saying he didn't have asthma. And he says, and I wondered if I should tell them about the 70,000 cigarettes I would inhaled every year for the last several decades. So he was, he was putting himself in the most difficult position for him. Uh, walking into his fears. Um, Facing them. Yeah, and I think he did that with Iraq when he supported the war and really proselytized for the war, went on the road for that war. And you were on the other side. But yeah, it I was on the other but side. But your friendship survived that. Oh, yeah. Um, I point of principle, never let a political disagreement affect a friendship. I'd seen my father lose very good friends over Vietnam. And... Um, I just think you have to separate the two things. You were friends, um, you and Christopher were friends from the time you were in your 20s. How did you cope with his passing? <clears throat> well, it was paradoxical in that um, it was an utter disaster. And I was I had a really classic case of denial. I refused to believe that it was, could possibly be fatal. And at one point, Ian McEwan said, in response to the piece about him, where I am harsh every now and then about his style, 
um, Ian said, but you, you can't say that. He doesn't need that now that he's dying. And I stopped myself from saying, but he's not dying. Mm -hmm. And that was you know, only a few months before he did die. Mm -hmm. um, I, it was an act of faith that he would get better. And his wife and I never wavered from that because we thought it would spread a de defeatist atmosphere if we, if we even considered that this was the end. So it, um, so it was a double, doubly shocking disaster when he died, uh, because I was completely unprepared for it. And he was so close to death, and, and I couldn't make the leap. But then when he did die, and his wife, is now his widow, felt the same way as I did. Um, I, I felt a tremendous increase in love of life after he died, because he loved life so much. And it, the, 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 what seemed to happen was that you took on his love of life, because he wasn't around to do it anymore. And I found that, uh, that I, a great surge of love of life that lasted for years. It's just beginning to fade now. Um, and Carol, his wife, felt that too. And um, so that was a, a marvelous gift he gave us from... From beyond. From the grave. Mm. Martin, it's been such a pleasure speaking to you. You'll be back on the show tomorrow, and we'll continue our conversation then. Okay. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.